everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I am going to be reading Chapter 7 from my granddad's book, Around the Horn, by Frank Downs. Chapter 7 includes 1944 Allied Air Forces increase attacks on Western Europe. Second Front imminent. Invasion of Europe. Central Band Tours of America and Europe. Dennis Matthews' Diary of the American Tour. Hollywood. Greer Garson. Aubrey Smith. May Whitty. Malcolm Sargent conducting the NBC Orchestra in New York. Lord Halifax. General Arnold. There were two pairs of brothers enrolled at Uxbridge as RAF musicians. The incomparable Brain Brothers, Dennis and Leonard, and later, Arthur and Ronald Atkinson, those marvellous brass players from Yorkshire. In 1942, the pairs increased to three, when my brother Leonard joined after giving an audition on violin, horn and singing. Leonard, six years my senior, was one of two brothers whose academic achievements were well ahead of the rest of us. He passed the entrance exam at the age of nine and went to the local Queen Mary's Grammar School where he excelled in music particularly and went on to Leeds University before going to Solihull to teach. Moving to Devon after war service, he eventually became Vice Principal of St Luke's College, Exeter. In 1954, UNESCO commissioned him to write a book called Teaching Mathematics in Tropical Primary Schools and subsequently he visited many African countries. The book was so successful that eventually it became a standard textbook throughout Europe, Asia and Australia, and several other books have followed. Having now retired, Leonard divides his time between his house in Topsham, Devon and Nerja in southern Spain, where he has a flat overlooking the Mediterranean. Arthur, seventh in line of brothers, was equally gifted academically and I always feel that he did not have the opportunity he deserved. Presumably, owing to the family's financial situation, he had to leave school at 15 and was denied the chance of going into higher education at that time. However, called up in the first batch of conscripts in 1939, he was, within weeks, drafted to an anti-tank unit as a corporal and early in 1940 became a sergeant. In 1941, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant and went to Algiers in a 1st Army anti-tank division, which was in the forefront of the assault on Tunis in 1943. In the invasion of Sicily in 1943, he was promoted to captain and went on with the 8th Army into Italy, and thence into Austria. Finally arriving in Greece with the rank of Major in 1944, he was also mentioned in dispatches. Demobbed in 1946, he became a teacher, but in 1950 went into the Army Education Corps as a Major and finally retired in 1967 as a Colonel. Taking an external BSc degree in economics, he settled in Exeter as a lecturer at the Technical College. Like many of the servicemen who had experienced the horrors of war in the front line, he has been very reluctant over the years to discuss that period. During 1944, we continued to move around the country, playing at concerts for the public and broadcasting, not only from London, but also Cardiff and Birmingham. In the latter city, we repeated marches on the same lines as in the Cardiff and South Wales tours, and I always look back with amusement on our first march in Birmingham, the city which I knew so well. Assembled at New Street Station and at the head of the Wings for Victory march, we made our way towards Hill Street on a route past the Town Hall, where the saluting base was situated, and into Broad Street as far as Five Ways and onto Hagley Road. People who know Birmingham will also know that Hill Street climbs rather steeply until it reaches the Town Hall in Victoria Square, and wind players will appreciate that blowing double forte, loudly, as one must, to be heard, is not easy, especially when some civic enthusiast was giving a running commentary on loudspeakers from a vantage point on the Town Hall. 
It was not possible to hear clearly what he was saying as we were halfway up the hill. There was so much noise in any case, coming from pavements crowded with onlookers waving flags. But as we turned left at the summit of the hill towards the saluting platform, he blared out in triumphant acclaim, Here come the boys who are blasting a hole in Hitler's fortress! I remembered little of the Old Testament lessons of my Methodist Sunday school days, but I was very impressed by the story in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. Joshua called seven priests to blow seven trumpets outside the walls of Jericho. Verse 20 reads, So the people shouted when the priests blew with trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. We had a good deal more than seven trumpets assembled, and there were plenty of people shouting. Could it have happened again? Had history repeated itself? Had we really, as the loudspeaker claimed, blasted a hole in Hitler's fortress? It was an amusing thought as we passed the saluting base without further incident. A few months ahead, however, we were to have the opportunity of putting that theory to the test. The invasion of Europe continued apace. Paris had been liberated in August and Brussels in September, though fighting was fierce on most fronts. By October, the British Second Army had established a bridgehead over the Maas River in Holland, whilst the RAF and USAF continued its offensive by day and night. In the early days of November, we learned that overseas tours had been planned for RAF Central Band and Orchestra. Rumours had been rife for some weeks. America, Far East, Middle East and Europe were amongst some of the areas designated. The strongest seemed to be America or Europe. Knowing that departure was imminent, Iris and I decided to marry and the joyful day was to be November the 11th, at the very same chapel where we had met. My brother Leonard was my best man, a duty he carried out with his usual aplomb. Although austere, due to wartime regulations, the day was a memorable one, 30 guests maximum, and a cake which was a marvellous effort from relations and friends who generously contributed their precious food coupons. We had not realised when arranging the ceremony for 11am that this was Remembrance Day, and as a consequence the service began with two minutes silence, which made the occasion even more profound. The rumour that the overseas tours would be to America and Europe proved to be true. The musicians chosen for the American tour left London on November the 30th for three months. Dennis Matthews left an informative and meticulous diary covering each day of the trip. For obvious reasons of security in wartime, no one had any idea of their destination. They reached Morecambe on the first night, and on the second they arrived in Gorok on the Clyde at 6am and thence on to the ship which they were told was the largest in the world. Excellent food, canteen selling cigarettes by the thousand, tobacco, chocolate and Pepsi Cola by the dozen. He records that there were 18 bunks in a peacetime cabin for two. A game called bingo each night which drained the pocket and lights out at 11.30. Fatigues in the galley and stores were part of the daily routine and their first concert on board was on their fourth day out on the Atlantic. The programme. Overture. The Merry Wives of Windsor by Nikolai. Sweet. Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. Symphony No. 8 in B minor by Schubert. Overture. Carnival by Vorjak. On the morning of the 8th of December, in poor visibility, they had their first view of the Manhattan skyline. 
and after disembarkation, were taken in luxurious coaches to Camp Kilmer near New Brunswick. From this point onward, Dennis records daily events in detail, some of which I think are well worth quoting. The overriding impression one gets from reading the diary is of the friction which existed between the conductor, Wing Commander O'Donnell, and the wartime recruits from professional orchestras. It was a situation which was inevitable given the vast divide between military attitudes to music and the independent mind of the professional musician. On the 14th of December, the first orchestral rehearsal since arriving is described thus. This morning, Rudy, as the musicians called Wing Commander O'Donnell, rehearsed the orchestra. He seemed in good spirits, but the D minor to Carter and Fugue, my orchestration, and the military band version played simultaneously. Soon killed ours. He goes on to say that at the concert at Constitution Hall, Washington, before a distinguished audience which included General Arnold and Lord Halifax, the following programme was played. National Anthem, US Air Force March, RAF March, Overture di Ballo, Sullivan, Westminster and Knightsbridge by Eric Coates, Elegy and Waltz, Serenade by Tchaikovsky, Overture, Orpheus in the Underworld by Offenbach, Symphony No. 6, First Movement by Glazunov, Voltova by Smetana, Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Bach. He listened in the audience and found it an embarrassing occasion. He writes, A beautiful concert hall, many fine musicians, but not one really moving sound in two solid hours. The Smetana was particularly unfortunate. No players can bring this music to life when constantly dogged by a completely inartistic element. As for the Bach, there was an organ in the hall. Surely the original would have been preferable to the thick, unbalanced mass of disorderly sound which came forth? His parting shot was that Rudy managed to conduct both Swan Lake and Tchaikovsky serenade waltzes in two. There were further problems at the British Officers Club when Dennis Brain and the Gorilla Quartet played the Mozart Horn Quintet, but refused to play more because of the disrespectful and ill-mannered behaviour of several present. At another function, Dennis Matthews gives an incredible description of having to participate in a type of cabaret entertainment. He describes it as an interminable evening of dancing, eating and frivolity, after which he was asked to play the Beethoven 32 variations, Brahms C major intermezzo and a Debussy prelude. He was followed by a comedian who pretended to be drunk and spewed comic faces in red liquid on a white screen. Such is fit company for the masters, was Dennis's concluding comment. Christmas Eve 1944 was a memorable one. In the afternoon, the orchestra and band gave a concert. Rudy lost his temper and broke his glasses. And in the evening, at a dinner given by the City of Atlanta, he, Dennis, won a bottle of whiskey with a ticket number 488, that of Kirchel for the Mozart A Major Piano Concerto. In Richmond, a few days later, the camp was seven miles outside town and they were invited to the NCO's mess, where apparently they paid more attention to the beer and fruit machines than the young ladies who set eyes on them. The food in the cookhouse was excellent, he writes, but Rudy seemed furious at being invited to eat with his men and wore the same look of cynicism as he does when conducting Bach and Mozart. He goes on. At the evening concert in the Richmond Concert Hall called The Mosque, I sat with a group of Americans and blushed inwardly as Rudy demonstrated his complete unmusicality. 1945 began with a visit to an RAF camp at Nassau, a depressing island of the Bahamas. In pouring rain we saw it under miserable conditions. 
Our first meal in the cookhouse was a sad affair, and instead of a warm welcome, we heard the familiar aside, Here come the f- fansmen. At an evening concert, he played Beethoven, Brahms and Poulenc to an enthusiastic audience, which included the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. He sees Rudy in differing attitudes three days later at an opening concert in Miami when he records the following. I played Brahms' F major ballade whilst Rudy spent his time trying to catch the strings out in Ina Kleiner by sudden changes of tempo and alternatively by swearing at them. Poor Wolfgang. We would slay the conductor but we daren't. In a more conciliatory frame of mind he writes... It was quite pleasant to me, considering my hair needed cutting, my buttons were not cleaned, and I was wearing shoes and khaki socks. In Houston later, however, he was on the back trail. At 4pm on the 13th of January, Rudy conducted the orchestra, and somehow he managed not to kill the Elgar Serenade. For a while I was transported back to the Cotswolds, such is the power of music even deep in the heart of Texas. Things were looking up, but shortly afterwards in San Antonio, the saga continues on familiar lines when Rudy's behaviour at a concert in the Camp Theatre brought forth this entry in the diary for the 15th of January. The condition of the piano precluded me from participating in the concert. I was able to get away to the billet to do some washing and I returned to the concert in time to hear Schubert's blood dripping on the floor in the unfinished. The 17th of January was, according to Dennis, a gloomy day. Pouring rain would alone have sufficed to make me despondent but it was a day of crisis for us all in connection with Rudy. He called a rehearsal in the morning which he dismissed after five minutes for no apparent reason other than a liver and a bad temper. At 4.15 he gave us all a lecture in which he expressed his feelings quite openly and bluntly. It was a shocking exhibition. It more or less boiled down to, I am a wing commander, you ought to bend your knee to me. I shall be glad to be rid of the lot of you. The strings have contaminated the band, and so on. The journey to Phoenix, Arizona, the longest train journey of the tour so far, was scheduled as 38 hours. In fact, it took 40 hours as it made an uninterrupted journey from Fort Worth. Captain Widener, the US transport officer with the party, made the observation that the railway company had abandoned the clock in favour of the calendar. The PBS poor bloody strings, were in trouble again at an open-air concert and there was considerable friction with them and the wing commander about exposing irreplaceable instruments to the hot sun. He threatened to send them back to Washington. According to Dennis, he eventually compromised and let them sit on the platform with unopened cases on their laps. Los Angeles was the next port of call, and after visits to MGM and Hollywood Canteen where they met Bette Davis, they were taken to play at a camp at Santa Ana. 50 miles by a coach driver who was an expert in speed and recklessness. On the following day they played at the Royal Hall where Greer Garson, Aubrey Smith and May Whitty spoke in aid of the war drive. On the 26th of February 1945, they returned to Washington DC to broadcast and thence to New York for their concert in the Waldorf Astoria. March the 3rd, Dennis records that together with pilot officer John Hollingsworth, he went to meet Malcolm Sargent who was rehearsing the NBC orchestra for a concert on the following day. Sargent was most friendly and invited them back to his hotel for drinks. Here the diary of the American tour ends. End of chapter 7 To end this podcast episode, I am going to play the first movement of Andrew Downs' Sonata for Eight Horns, a work that was premiered in the Keller Hall at the University of New Mexico, which lies somewhere near the route of Dennis Matthews' 40-hour train journey from Fort Worth, Texas to Phoenix, Arizona. Andrew Downs' Sonata for Eight Horns was commissioned by James Lowe, Janice Lee Sperling, MD, and the British Horn Trust for Ellen Campbell and the Horn Octet of the University of New Mexico. 
The premiere took place on the 29th of March 1995. Stanislav Suchanek, who played first horn in the world premiere, introduced the work to his colleagues in the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra, with the result that they performed the work for the first time in the Czech Republic in 1997 and went on to record it in 1998. This recording is by the horns of the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra for the Artismon label.